and welcome to 89.5 KOPN. This is uh, this week's edition of the Mid-Missouri Freedom Forum. I'm your host, Mitch Richards. I'm sticking it out for myself this week. Steve Spellman is on vacation, and God bless him for it. And so uh, we're just going to cruise along here. We had a very brief technical issue, but I think we're doing just fine now. Um, thankfully, this week uh, is a very interesting one. There's been some interesting issues uh, nationwide concerning criminal justice uh, in, in the country. Just the other day, uh, Attorney General Eric Holder made a speech calling for uh, the need to re-examine the country's uh, mandatory minimum laws, the laws which uh, require uh, individuals convicted of felonies, particularly drug felonies, to to serve a certain amount of time. We have them at the federal level. We have them at the state level. And so we decided this week to make a show about the uh, changing views and changing approaches that are being uh, advocated and asserted on the right side of the political spectrum. So to begin the show today, we have um, from an organization known as uh, Conservatives Concerned About the Death Penalty uh, is a relatively newly formed group, uh, which whose title, obviously, you can figure out what it's about. It's uh, it's an op- a group in opposition to the death penalty, largely, and we're going to hear all about that from our guests. And, uh, you know, I, wa- I wanted to explore this issue because I think it's important to hear why uh, folks on the right now are, are – we're starting to reexamine the uh, traditional uh, lock them up and throw away the key approach to criminal justice. And, of course, uh, part of that has always been the death penalty, which is a lot as a deterrent and all of that. So today on the show, uh, from uh, conservatives concerned about the death penalty, we have uh, Mr. Mark Hyden. He's calling in um, uh, on the air, and I think we have him. Mark, are you there? Mitch, uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, again, uh, for those folks just tuning in, we have Mark Hyden of Cons- Conservatives Concerned About the Death Penalty, and this is uh, 89.5 KOPN, this week's edition of the Missouri Freedom Forum. Mark, uh, Tell us about uh, conservatives concerned about the death penalty, CCA TDP, I think is the uh, uh, the abbreviation, isn't it? Um, when was it yeah, founded? It tell, tell us a little about the organization. I know that it's uh, originally, at least, it, it was founded in my home state of Montana, where I come from, which is interesting because also another organization that I'm involved with, the Fully Informed Jury Association, uh, is from Montana as well. So tell us about the Montana connection, but also tell us about uh, the organization in general, please. Sure. Well, the uh, effort actually began in 2009. They had the official debut of the Montana Conservatives Concerned About the Death Penalty. They officially debuted at the uh, GOP state convention. Um, but it started beyond that. A coalition of elected uh, leaders who were all conservatives came together, and they realized that they all had concerns about the death penalty. Um, and it became very successful. Uh, it became uh, uh, that grassroots actually demanded that a national group be formed. And that's what sparked the initiative to create the national conservatives concerned about the death penalty. And we actually just had our uh, official debut at CPAC uh, in Maryland uh, in March. I see. So it started, you know, because a lot of folks don't realize is that uh, Montana is an interesting place. You know, look, thinking about it there, it's a place that, you know, sort of has a libertarian bent, but nationally uh, getting a national voice like that. Tell us about, uh, if you would, why do you think it's important to have a, a conservative voice which questions the death penalty? Why, why now? Why not 20 years ago? What, what, what is happening in, in the conservative movement, and why, uh, why would there be a need to reexamine uh, the death penalty? Tell us about that. Well, uh, conservatives concerned about the death penalty as a group. We're just an ever-growing national um, group of conservatives and libertarians who know that the death penalty is completely inconsistent with our values. And our main goal is to uh, educate everyone, to let them know that that myth out there of conservatives blindly supporting the death penalty is entirely false. Um, And if you would have been at CPAC with us, uh, we brought nine people with us to work the booth, and we had lines of people waiting to talk to us. So that shows that the uh, conservatives don't blindly support the death penalty. That's that's a joke. Um, We also wanted to provide a forum for conservatives and libertarians to really have this discussion and uh, dialogue with each other. Uh, and continue what they've already been doing. And beyond that, we're engaging in the grassroots and grass tops outreach. Uh, but the way that we spend or we see out of control spending with the government and an ever growing government, I think this is the right time for us to have this discussion. Uh, it's time to bring spending under control and um, you know make government not so big. And I think that's why more and more conservatives are getting on the board. Uh, for me personally, uh, when I was thinking about the death penalty back when I worked for the NRA. Um, I, it, was, it was this easy. I just gave the death penalty what I call the conservative witness test. 
there's three tenets in my book uh, of conservative. Uh, is the program uh, pro-life? Absolutely not. You run the risk of killing innocent people. Um, and whether you're conservative, libertarian, liberal, centrist, progressive, that's unacceptable. And I think everybody can agree on that. Um, next is this representative of a limited government. Not by a long shot. Not unless you think that a, um, a government that's powerful enough to put you to death is limited government. And lastly, is it a fiscally responsible program? Uh, and the answer to that is a resounding no. Uh, it's more coffee on every single level um, uh, of the process. Uh, so this is why conservatives are coming together, um, and we're building our numbers, and uh, we're having this discussion at a national level. Backing up through some of those issues, and I find it really fascinating, you come from the National Rifle Association, I'm a member myself, um, it is a transition, I guess, from the Second Amendment to a broader issue like the death penalty. Uh, you know, when we look at some of the academic literature out there, the, the death sentence is an interesting one in, in Western societies over the last couple hundred years. It used to be a, a public affair. Uh, the last public execution, if, if you read the works of, of Michel Foucault, was in 1925 here in America. Uh, I think it was in a southern state. I can't remember where. Uh, you know, illegal public uh, as execution. And, uh, morals have changed, society has changed, and so the last decades since then, we have still had public ex uh, execution, but uh, execution, but not public. We, we, it's done. A, it's a private affair. There are the victims of uh, the person that was uh, killed in the. In the particular case uh, might view it, and of course, uh, government officials, usually the governor and a variety of of, pub, of uh, law enforcement agents and that sort of thing. Um, Something changed in that time, and now you mentioned uh, the issue of life, and I think that's an interesting one because long, for a long time, uh, conservatives have taken heat uh, from the left because uh, obviously the right uh, conservatives are, are very uh, very uh, outspoken on the need to protect life, particularly with respect to um, the, the abortion issue. But then there was the charge that well, you care about um, when they're in the womb, but when they're out, you, you don't anymore, uh, and, and that's sort of a crude uh, thing to say. But I mean that that is a criticism that the right is always. Uh, had to endure that uh, you that we support pe folks, you know, when they're in the womb. But uh, when it comes to state ex execution, it's uh, perfectly acceptable. Why do you think that that there has to? There, it's not. I can't just accept that this is just a, a question of a fiscal issue or a limited government. There has, seems to be a change in in the, literally the moral way that we conceptualize this. Tell us about that, as far as you can speak to it. Well, when I hear liberals say that, that well, you just want to protect uh, life in the womb but not out of the womb, they must not be listening because there's a very large number of conservatives, especially conservative Catholics, that believe in a consistent life ethic. I sat down with Michael Steele the other day who's opposed to the death penalty. And that was the number one reason why he said he cannot support the death penalty because he is consistently pro-life. So this is Mark, if you could briefly tell, who is Michael Steele, by the way, if you just tell our listeners? Uh, the former uh, RNC chairman and also former lieutenant governor of Maryland. But this uh, consistent life ethic is, um, is not uh, just a small number of conservatives. There are many conservatives uh, that feel this way. So I, that's, I just don't buy into that when, when liberals say that. Sure, but okay. Then, then leaving the uh, the charge that it's a, it's, a, it's a criticism, but just uh, as a conservative, um, do you think that there has? I mean, among conservatives, I should say, do you think that there has been a change? And in, because in, you know, for many years, the death uh, support of the death penalty was a tenet part of traditional conservatism, going back to Reagan and before. Um, that you know, people who do certain crimes, the only acceptable. Uh, means of punishment for that is is, is death. Uh, obviously, you know, cold blooded murder, so to speak. Why? I mean, we still have that today as as uh, a societal ill. Um, why 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 would that change? Well, I think the answer to that is very simple. Most conservatives want to be tough on crime. I personally think that I'm tough on crime, but I want to be smart on crime too. And since 1976, over 140 individuals have been wrongfully convicted. Uh, of murder, and they've been on death row and eventually released, and many others have been put to death when there were serious uh, doubts uh, regarding their verdict. And if you're pro-life, you don't want to see innocent people put to death, and this is a system that gets it wrong over and over and over again. And if we have a broken system that's running uh, the risk of killing innocent people, why would we keep that? I mean, that's not just a pro-life issue. That's just common sense. And that, that's something that, that uh, you know, there's uh, chapters of that, that organization, the Innocence Project. Uh, I know in Montana, there's a Montana Innocence Project. In Missouri, there's one. Uh, in Texas, there's one. Texas is a big one because there's obviously 
something like 40 some percent of the executions that are done today are, are in Texas. Uh, and I think that that's, that's obviously a big one. I mean, for a conservative, if we, be, if you believe in limited government, if you believe in the common law, the due process, your right to a trial by a jury of your peers, all of that, uh, it is admittedly an imperfect system. Uh, it's one that protects, uh, protects people from government. But at the same time, as you mentioned, people do get wrongly convicted from time to time. And that, that always seemed like an issue that, that conservatives need to re, re, reconsider at least because, as you said, I, I mean, that's a fairly reliable thing. We know we actually have concrete cases today of people who actually were executed and, and uh, were later found to be, have been uh, innocent. Is that not correct? Absolutely. And, and one of my friends who's the former Rutherford County GOP chairman in North Carolina and worked for Congressman Charles Taylor, the longtime uh, GOP congressman, uh, he told me there's no Rick Perry oops moment. If you execute the wrong person, it's too late. You can't write that wrong. And I think that's something that we're all concerned about. Sure. And I mean, I, and I think another aspect of those who are on death row, it's not just that you have the innocent, but there seems to be a disproportionate number of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of minorities, of folks who, um, on death row who, you know, are, are, uh, from the, you know, the, our people of color. And I think that that enforces, uh, you know, an image of the government of, of criminal justice and also of the conservative position on the death penalty as one as being a negative one. Do you think that that is a factor at all in the, in, in, in oh, this? Absolutely. If you look at Colorado, the last, um, statistics I saw was Colorado is 4.3% African American, but their death row is 100% African American. That should raise some red flags for everybody, and that is an issue. Um, if you are a minority or if you are um, living below the poverty line, you have a much higher risk of being put to death than if you're white or you're living fairly well. So that is an issue that um, there's a very a lot of unfairness when it comes to death penalty. It's very biased. So you're absolutely correct there. I see. Well, what about the uh, the spending issue? Tell us about that. Uh, how much? Is there really a savings if we were to get rid of the death penalty? Is, has someone actually done uh, the research on that? Has it been quantified? T tell our listeners about that. Well, you had mentioned that as your second main uh, reason. Study after study has actually shown that the death penalty is more expensive than a case, a uh, comparable case with life without parole penalty. I mean, every level it's more expensive. Uh, and it is for, for several reasons. Uh, unlike most criminal cases, there are two trials at the initial uh, phase. Uh, one to decide the verdict, and the other to decide whether or not they can face the death penalty. So it's already twice as long, and each individual trial is much longer than a normal trial. Then there's an appeals process that is much longer, and they bring in specialists, and they have more motions than any other trial or any other appeals process. And then they house them in on death row, which is much more expensive than a maximum security uh, prison. Um, and so this appeals process goes on a long time. Let's not forget that some people are dying of natural causes waiting on uh, the death penalty. So all of this uh, culminates to an incredibly expensive uh, program. I, I was talking with State Representative Steve McManus the other day uh, in Tennessee, and he told me that uh, it's time fiscal conservatives just get real um, and take a look at wasteful government programs. And he especially was talking about the death penalty. And I think we're starting to see that with more and more uh, elected officials. They, uh, they've been saying they're fiscal conservatives for a long time, and now they're getting ready to show it. Well, when we talk about conservative voices in opposition to the death penalty, you mentioned Michael Steele, the former uh, head of the Republican National Committee uh, and former uh, Lieutenant Governor of Maryland. Who, what are, who are the other issues nationwide, uh, quote unquote, conservatives and or Republicans, if we can mesh the two together? I know that, that that's not always accurate to do, but uh, who are the other individuals beginning to speak out against the death penalty from that area of the political spectrum? Well, there's no shortage of uh, political and ideological leaders that are coming out against the death penalty. Most recently, Ron Paul came out. Uh, he actually released a statement of support of what uh, we're doing um, and also said that if you uh, believe in traditional conservatism or libertarianism, then that's inconsistent with the, having the death penalty. And we obviously agree with them. And that underscores uh, what we've been hearing across the nation. Conservatives just aren't buying into this government power anymore. Richard Vigory uh, Jay Sekulow, Brent Bozell, and as you mentioned, Michael Steele have all come out and said, we're really concerned about this. This is not the right uh, program to be having. But we're also seeing the youth, the grass tops leaders of the youth are also uh, uh, saying this. Julie Borowski, who's an award-winning uh, uh, libertarian blogger, she came out and opposed the death penalty. Then Jeff Frazee, 
Uh, he's the founder and uh, executive director for uh, Young Americans for Liberty. He came out against the death penalty. So um, it's resounding. There's many that are constantly coming out, uh, and whether you're libertarian or you're conservative, somewhere in the middle, and regardless of your age or demographic, uh, it seems to be something that everybody is coming around to. Well, tell us about then, I mean, this is a grassroots organization to our folks tuning in. Uh, we're speaking to Mark Hyden of the conservative con- group conservatives concerned about the death penalty, a, a right of center group uh, that, that speaks out against the death penalty nationwide and various issues. Uh, when we think about an actual case, uh, in, you know, more than just advocacy, which obviously is very important. Uh, you had mentioned when we spoke earlier, the case of Warren Hill in Georgia, and I know that that involves something that we've been seeing nationwide where uh, the actual uh, drug, the lethal drug that they inject for the executions in many states, there's actually a shortage of it because uh, no one will make it. So there's a liability and, and a lot of manuf- pharmaceutical companies don't want to be often the company known to make the, uh, the, the quote unquote killer drug um, that, you know, that a, that a state or federal government would use. Tell us about the Warren Hill case. What are the factors there? And there's something about keeping the, uh, the lethal uh, drug that they use top secret. Tell us about that, and how is that uh, conservative concern about the death penalty involved with that? Sure, and I'm by no means an expert uh, in this field, or especially on the Warren Hill case, but, uh, you know, I would say that first and foremost, I'm a conservative, and what was happening to Warren Hill really, it just disgusted my conservative sensibilities, because I support principled and transparent government, but what you had um, with his case, the state government and a, a judicial system in Georgia that was just determined on executing a, a man who had been found to be mentally disabled, uh, and they were going to execute him through a secretive manner. Uh, Supreme Court, uh, Atkins versus Virginia, said you can't execute a mentally, uh, quote, mentally retarded individual. And Georgia state law has a similar law in the books. Uh, and Warren Hill was found to be mentally disabled by seven out of seven medical professionals. So that seemed like an open and shut case, but he did not get an uh, indefinite stay of execution because of that. What happened was, to make matters worse in Georgia, uh, my home state, is that the state of Georgia passed a law making it a state secret where they obtained these death penalty drugs and what the death penalty drugs actually were. We have no idea what they were. So Warren Hill was actually granted a stay of execution recently because of the secrecy of the death penalty drugs, and uh, he was actually done on the day that he was supposed to be executed. So it actually came down to the line. And to me, what does that say about my home state of Georgia? It says it was willing to kill a mentally disabled person, uh, regardless of Supreme Court precedent, regardless of state laws, regardless of medical professionals' opinions, and they wanted to do so in a secret manner using secret drugs, and that's, that's not limited government. It's not principled government, and it's definitely not a transparent government, and that should have been not just conservatives and libertarians, but everybody. Uh, so we tend to get involved on Certain cases generally were more policy oriented, so we just tried to generate awareness of what was going on uh, and get people to write letters to the editor or any way to put pressure and uh, to bring uh, to educate more people about the Warren Hill case. As far as uh, education and outreach, uh, you, you've gone national. Are you? Uh, is, is the organization going to be targeting certain states where? Because obviously, certain states we don't don't even have. Uh, execution anymore? Are, are there are, are there certain areas of the country? It would be uh, Texas, for example, or are there other states? Uh, is 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 there a strategic yeah. approach to this at all? Or sure, there's several states where they are forming their own local conservatives concerned about the death penalty groups, and we will be helping them. And we're also working in different states. Uh, we do have some members of the conservatives concerned in Texas, uh, but Nebraska, Kansas, Kentucky, Delaware, North Carolina, and New Hampshire, the states. Uh, that have really been very interested in building up their own groups. Uh, we have a member also in Kansas built up a conservative concern group. So you're seeing this pop up everywhere. So this is not localized to to just you know Atlanta where I live uh, or Brooklyn where we're headquartered. This is uh, this is nationwide and there's a lot of interest in it. Great. Well, tell us, um, just because we're going to wrap up here uh, toward the end of the hour, uh, again, we're speaking with Mark Hyden, a conservative concerned about the death penalty. I know that the, uh, con- the Conservative Political Action Committee conference, the, the annual CPAC, as it's known, this year uh, in September, if I'm not mistaken, is actually going to be held uh, near here in Missouri in, in St. Louis. And uh, the uh, concern- conservatives concerned about the death penalty will be there, uh, if I'm not correct. Tell us about that. Um, tell us if, how exciting it must be to actually be taking part in CPAC, uh, if you would, please. Well, we were 
we're excited to be a part of uh, the national CPAC in Maryland this year, but we're even more excited to be a part of uh, a local CPAC too. Um, We'll be exhibiting there. We will probably be on some sort of panel. Um, And again, it's on September 28th. Uh, So anyone that's interested in learning more about conservatives concerned about the death penalty or just conservative uh, conservatism and limited government in general, then I'd recommend they attend. CPAC is it's really just one of a kind, and they have a very exciting lineup of uh, political thought leaders, workshops, and panel discussions. So uh, as I recall from the last time I talked with some of uh, my friends from the American Conservative Union, they they are tickets available. So if you're you're available and in the St. Louis area, come out and see us. Great. Last uh, quick question before you give us a, one last plug of the website and everything, Mark. Uh, it's tell us, what do you think has been the reception among uh, traditional uh, conservative politicians who, uh, you know, who have actually spoken in favor of the death penalty in times past? Do you really think that this is going to be something that that would be uh, that you could ever make appeal to them or appeal to their constituents? How do you cross that that bridge when you have someone who actually is on the record supporting the death penalty in times past? And I've had a lot of these discussions, especially when I was in Tennessee talking with the lieutenant governor and I talked with a few other legislators. And I think most of them are pretty open-minded if you uh, speak their language of, you know, like I said earlier, pro-life policies, uh, fiscal uh, responsibility, and limited government. Uh, They want to save money, and they want to have pro-life policies. So you can get them there, but usually I ask them, uh, if they don't trust the government to fill potholes or to deliver the mail, why on earth would they give them the power to make life and death decisions? And usually that, that gets them over to our side quite easily. <laughs> Amen to that. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mark. I, again, of conservatives concerned about the death penalty. Would you kindly just uh, plug uh, your organization, uh, the website, uh, where folks can get more information and, and drop uh, and mention also uh, CPAC, if you would, and then we're going to round out the half hour and take a short break for our listeners here on 89.5 KOPN. Absolutely. If you're uh, interested in learning more or uh, viewing any of our fact sheets, go to conservativesconcern.org. If you'd like to contact me personally, it's info at conservativesconcern.org, and we will be at CPAC St. Louis September 28th, and we would love to see you there. Great. Well, thanks so much, Mark. I appreciate your time, and I look forward to uh, perhaps even meeting you there in St. Louis. Absolutely. You have a great night. All right, bye-bye now. And why don't we just take a short break because we're going to be coming back. Uh, in the second half of the hour, we're going to be having uh, a gentleman named Vikrant Reddy. He's a policy analyst at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. He's going to be discussing the Right on Crime Project, uh, which is a uh, conservative uh, reexamination of the, quote-unquote, uh, lock them up and throw away the key approach to crime, which we've had since uh, going back to the Nixon administration. We're going to be discussing that with Vikrant in the second half of the show, and uh, we look forward to hearing you here on KOPN 89.5. 